<laughs> whatever's required. Um, I worked in a, I consulted on a permaculture farm, uh, mm -hmm. but in a, supply, in a supply chain where I ran the production kitchen and had to kind of create products which were very suited to the market. And I saw the kind of, I saw that there was an intersection between, <laughs> hey, um, hi, how are you? <laughs> Um, so before we start, should we just introduce each other so we know where I we're think it's coming good. from? Yeah, and as we're doing that, we can wait for more people to arrive if they're going to arrive. Um, so, would you like to go first? Who is you? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Amanda. Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Janssen. I'm based in the Netherlands. Uh, poof, I have some years of activism behind me. Um, I'm a connector for WeShare, which is a French and now worldwide community on, uh, I, I would say, collaboration and sharing. Uh, mm -hmm. From there, I have had a lot of um, um, involvement in the commons and peer-to-peer -peer systems. And the last two years, I have also been active in whole systems uh, and in the community in Rotterdam here uh, with the uh, new map S7 foundation, which is quite interesting. And uh, they're now what, in- what foundation? S7 Foundation. S7 Foundation. They are building new software, and one of their programmers is momentarily part of Holochain. So I'm kind of in the tech field. I'm in the community field. I'm in peer to peer. And what most fascinates me is the human factor. So, how do we live together, and how do we remain our involvement with the human factor? You know, whatever we do, how do we respect each other? Uh, have a meta conversation on value systems. Uh, keep it safe because it's very. I think it's very challenging sometimes. So our community work that we're doing, and group dynamics. I think that's yeah, that's great. really 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 whoa, <laughs> far out. <laughs> the most challenging until now. And uh, for food, it's quite interesting because I had some conversations during my involvement with that community with somebody willing to create a, a huge alternative food system uh, for a collapse scenario, actually. So, for a collapse scenario? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. There's people with collapse scenarios too. <laughs> so, I, I like to do the extremes. I'm normally functioning best in between two extremes, and then a lot of things can be learned. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm joining tonight because I wanted to keep in touch with all the circles uh, oh. going on. And I just saw it popping up in my messenger, and I was saying, okay, let's, let's join. So, uh, Halo, would you like to say something? Uh, sure. Um, so um, I'm here. Um, oh, where is this? Let's see. There's a couple different pieces. I really resonated uh, with a lot of what you shared, Amanda, about your background. And I'm curious to like hear more or maybe have some links, but uh, familiar with a few of those pieces. My um, current trajectory a lot uh, through is through several different organizations, but also through the pattern of collaborating, which I'm very strongly in favor of uh, moving into the, the verb space rather than the noun space and, and figuring out how to get out of the silos of like, I am this organization or I am this brand or, you know, but also to continue to see the value of those uh, types of containers. So a lot of that for me from my permaculture background is about seeing in living systems and then being able to adapt uh, all of our processes and, and ways to work together and all the other things into living systems design, um, which is often designed by emergence, yet is also, you know, complementary uh, from both those, those ways. And um, in the economy type of sphere, and so within Village Lab, uh, where I've worked a lot there, we would also do a lot of work around commons, um, commons of solutions with the regenerative solutions and also commons of new economies, so regenerative economy, which definitely swirled into the, uh, the whole chain space, meta currency and meta capital. So work with Sean Edgeborn 
uh, departments there on the Meta Impact Framework, that whole project, and especially keen on how value flows are um, a major part of being able to make visible those flows that are non-monetary but are of all these other kinds of value that are really important. So it's very, it feels almost completely straightforward to me, yet the process of <laughs> making it, you know, making it work and, and getting the systems uh, prototyped and trying it out is a lot of it. Um, and then the food systems mapping um, thing in particular for part of why I'm here in this conversation is that um, in the Columbia River Gorge, which is the area where I'm uh, focused uh, in, as Portland and the Columbia Gorge, um, I'm part of an educational nonprofit there that is supporting thriving communities a lot through supporting individuals um, at, um, the, at the youth level, but also through um, looking at you know, systemic change. And part of that includes mapping existing food systems and, uh, and working with the local, um, the local folks around that. And in the Columbia Gorge, we have a really nice spot um, for building coherence around that. There's a, there's a fair amount of local food pride and, and local business pride and like, you know, that kind of awareness. So it feels like a good space. Um, I was kind of hoping Christina might pop in today. I may set ping her to see if she can. Um, but I had a really wonderful uh, chat with India and I'm excited about what is possible just through um, the, the sense making across different, uh, different places that we're inhabiting and seeing how it all can be complementary and how we can uh, create win-win uh, resilient systems. So that seemed long-winded, but I know we have a smallish group, so I thought I would kind of go with that. So that <laughs> nice to be here. Um, just I'm right. I I'm going to write notes and then I'll fill, I'll populate that thing afterwards. Then. Um, okay. Yeah, and and you know, if we want to take some notes at the same time here. We can do that or, or leave it to you. Um. Okay. So um, just to be, try and sort of get across the point I am making, which is specifically about rewilding habits as opposed to rewilding land, is one of the, one of the, like crises of, of why it's so difficult to change is that everything that we exist upon is counterintuitive to biodiversity. And when I say from kind of, it's, it's just when you learn about figures of how much is grown in a particular way in the food system, it's only sort of 3% is grown organically in, the UK, 3% in Jersey. And you when you talk about kind of siloed, when you go and meet people doing it, you feel like the whole world's doing it. But then when you, when you actually look at the land and map it out, um, biodiversity is definitely not on the agenda. And I've been um, trying to understand, I sort of obnoxiously coined it nature versus nurtured habit. And how kind of our, our nurtured habit is what is at present the inhibitor of the success of nature and that is looks at kind of in our economy and but more kind of obviously in my day in my day-to-day -day habits of um what i do i know i inhibit biodiversity even to the point of having a funeral where for the majority of people it's you fell a tree you mine some stone and then you're laid in a manicured field forever and a day. And that's a kind of, even at afterlife, you're sort of inhibiting a form of biodiversity. And so one of the, when I was kind of rethinking a food system, which I've been in the, in a sort of luxury position of doing in Jersey, following my time in India, I, sort of try to, to take on the challenge of converting this island over a period of time into a biodiverse agriculture land and how to do that and took a lot of invest did quite a lot of investigation and found that in Jersey we had a huge amount of capability to grow an abundance of food 
um, I did a exhibition at the beginning of the year called Re Rewild Your Plate and found that we were growing over 400 different, 450 different varieties of edible food. And within the uh, more ec ecological farmers, that was 150 was grown sort of in the form of agriculture, I suppose. Yet campaigns and recipes online, the internet, good food guide, all the, everything that was kind of talking to me was talking about going vegan and rewilding a different part of the land. And instead, I just kind of, it confused me slightly that why you would divide the land up into these two functions, which is one to rewild and the other to, to grow in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, relatively sterile form of nature. Um, so in, in trying to create a food system from scratch, I've been looking about how to bring in a huge, as much as, um, as much as diversity into the system as possible, but without having to dislodge habit. And habit is, you know, the majority of us in terms of how we eat is formed really at a very young age. And there was a guy, a gentleman said, who said to me, who runs a organization called angio.org, um, his name's Dr. William Lee. He's a, he, he looks at food and drug interactions. And he stated to me that if you're trying to change habit, you, we will lose a battle. And you've got to design and change um, as, much as, as much as people offer lip service to doing the right thing the the physical and kind of sensorial response that someone has to make in order to achieve achieve the level of of habit change is, is quite extraordinary and not sure if it'll happen before um the time runs out in a way so with all these kind of factors i started to unpick how like all the different elements of how to how to create as much biodiversity within a food system. Does that make any sense? Or I, what does that mean? That I wanted to know uh, what you believe, because you, you spoke to this guy of NGO.org and you spoke on design in change is better than change habits. But do you think it's sustainable if it's just designed in? Do I think it's sustainable if it's just designed in? Um, yep. I think one of the one of the it's food, right? No, I think it's about everything. <laughs> I would say, I so, would say. So, the so let's start. Let's start with food because that's where um, that's where my understanding lies, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I feel like it's one of the areas where the majority of people have an opportunity to interact with the countryside is in their food habit. So mm -hmm. on a day to day basis, they, inter they are, they are responsible for the commons land. They're responsible for the countryside every day when they're consuming, no matter where they are in the world. Mm -hmm. And if it's a, it takes one's stomach to a relationship to anywhere in the world in the globalized food market. It's an incredibly intimate form of globalization is how we eat. And, mm -hmm. and then in that, our kind of sensory response to living things all around the world happens within our stomach every day, more so than on the internet and you know, with real, real living cells and microbiology and all of that stuff. So starting with food is is on a sensory level is something i understand the most and there was a i came across this these two people in copenhagen who their agenda was to bring was to get school children eating the most amount of organic food as possible so mm -hmm. starting at a young age ensuring that habits are formed that there's a, there's a sensory response to quality within the system. Mm -hmm. and in Jersey here, I don't, I, it's great feeding 
rich old people or any old people. But to me, it's if we can direct the, as much of that food to school children and younger, you're sort of developing a sensory response that when they get older, they'll, they'll, they'll form a market of change because they'll expect, they won't be saying, as an 80 year old, I remember when tomatoes tasted really good 100 years ago. So, but this could be as well uh, a way or a means to change habits by making young children early consume organic food. So, or you could yeah, see it as a design. Creative. My my question was more conceptual, but that's. Oh, in terms of, um, do I think habits are? Um, it was a very engaging comment that he made that pushed me towards kind of thinking more about the invisible side of change or the invisible infrastructure that prevents change or um, there's a really interesting paper by a guy called Jeff Rayner which is uh, which is looking at evolution as a form of novelty and habit so things happen continually at the same as something super novel comes along and changes that and I think we're in a time where yes things are super novel now and can force a change. Um, but designing in... And you would in, be in favour. Huh? Would be in favor. Hello? I, I mean, there's... I'm sorry. Yeah, to me, there I guess, is actually, I would, process wise, yeah. I was wondering if it might be good to hear from other, like it turned a little bit into a conversation. Um, yeah, it totally. Yeah. Amanda in India there, which is okay with me too, but I was just wondering. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not, it's quite, I find it quite, um, I'm not that good at uh, how to process out my ideas and bring it into conversation. Um, because it feels like a, yeah, I'm not that good at that. So any advice would be perfect. <laughs> well, maybe like a round or one thought that I had, because you shared, you know, you shared an opening sense of, uh, of the kind of like the, the thesis of it in that sense about habits. Yeah. And then so far Amanda did share, and then it just maybe would be possibly um, to get some reflections from Danny okay. and myself for you too, because I, I really appreciate what you're bringing and I think you did present it, but um, also... I didn't think she was done though. In, uh, yeah. It didn't seem complete in the basic set of ideas you wanted to present and you know, Amanda came in with sort of a clarifying question, which is fine, but for me personally, I'd, I'd like to hear a little more from you before we do a round, but you're in charge. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just get to, I'll just take a minute or two to um, get to a question and then I'll put it out if that makes sense. So I'm pulling from a broad form of theory with, and lots of different things that I've, I've pulled together. Um, some quite embodied issues I have about my own decisions and choice making um, through to the conversations I have with people who, how diet is very much embodied as well and people people are very kind of internal about what they choose to eat and it people are starting to change and think about their impact but when as a chef it that's a rare conversation over the past sort of six years of, of being a chef so just we've set up this uh We've set up this cooperative in Jersey. We have eight or so farmers and 180 members. And it, um, is a, it's a reflection, it's a similar project to the one that was in India, apart from this has been done with no investor. And it uses eight farmers instead of one single farmer with lots of different land. Um, one of the, issues we have is we have some farmers with 10 kilos of product a week and some farmers with lots lots more and a huge variety and a, and an audience of people with lots of quite set in habits um, we've used plastic free as an entry point of habit change because people are understanding that um, and i set up a 
I set up an investigation which asked a whole range of stakeholders from government to farmers to distributors, restaurant owners, uh, consumers at different age groups and kind of different uh, price brackets. Um, what a series of questions, which were four questions very simply. Um, what are your current practices? Do you want to change more ecologically? What are and what are the things that are stopping you from changing, or what's stopping you from changing, and any sort of any further ideas about any things that you'd like to do around change? And from that, those four questions I did a sort of a cross analysis to find that that sitting in that those kind of ideas were a lot more very simple issues that. Um, a lot about values for farmers, a lot about uh, times for chefs, environmental policies for chefs, uh, environmental health policies, sorry. Um, the choices that a consumer has to make, which don't quite fit the options that don't work on a value level. So if it's organic, it's usually wrapped in plastic, why is it wrapped? and all these different things. <clears throat> and from that, from those series of questions, sort of found that that there, there were very obvious and very easy to fix issues within the within kind of pushing for change, and they can be fixed within a design of a of a shop. And one of the um, how we've designed the shop is we have three hundred and fifty product lines. We're open a particular time. Uh, convenient times in the week um, I have a we have a production kitchen which looks at waste innovation and product diversity and products that sit around habits and we have a waste system of collection and like compost collection um, we've managed to do it on a not-for-profit basis on a crowdfunding and we have a we have a membership fee that people pay and then get discounts for and people who are on benefits only pay a 20% uh, of the membership fee and this is and it seems to be working so we're, we're about we're about two months in now and the farmers on the farmers for the next season are sort of deciding are working together to plant stuff to increase diversity as much as possible um, and to kind of fill the gaps for the import of the imports that are happening currently. Um, we're not, we don't, we're happy to import where necessary because it's more important to address the full needs of those members um, and over time and we can wait for the market to grow and the farmers to plant more. And, on, um, and we've just agreed with the, uh, with the policy writers for, next, for the next rural economy strategy that any profits in our business, they go to back towards agriculture, um, organic agriculture infrastructure, if it be uh, the purchasing inputs or something like that. And they've now agreed to match fund because they like the idea of a subsidy which is market led. And, the more the community engaged with it, the more profit, the more the farmers are getting paid. So it, it's an easy sell within the subsidy market because the market is there, if that makes sense. Does that make any sense? So that's a kind of where that's the where the setup is. I think that last part may not have been clear. I know because you and I were talking about it earlier, but basically the UK government is gonna contribute the Jersey government. The Jersey government. So whatever the profits are of the cooperative they're going to match that with a contribution to the cooperative's general fund of operations. Is that right? Yeah, to invest in um, organic agricultural infrastructure because it in, because they are encouraged by the idea that there's a market there and the farmers don't have to market themselves or find a market. There's a there's a local community buying. So when it so when one pound is spent to the into the shop by the members 50 pence order already goes to that of the farmer 
and then any profits are made gets match funded and then goes back to the farmer at the end of the year for infrastructure so they feel like it's a really good value for money on that front um so that's a system that's happening and it's going quite it's going okay but the one thing i want to try and push through ideas and conversation is how to how to kind of manipulate the consumer or kind of support the consumer to address more biodiversity habits within that and how how you would encourage and how how these functions can be used more to habitualize a rewilding or biodiversity that's a, that's where that's what i'm looking at if that makes sense um and i wonder if anyone would like to ask any questions or take it further or anything like that um that, that. I'm sort of thinking that maybe Piala, are you, is your name Piala? <laughs> wants to go first. <laughs> I had a lot of questions on design and the, but we can wait. So let, let's do the round first, let's say. Go on, Kayala. Oh, um, you know, at the moment, yeah, I just appreciate what you're sharing. Um, I, I've actually, because we had that conversation the other day, also, you know, looking at um, how, uh, yeah, just the process of creating the conditions for habits to change. Um, and sounds like you have had some practice at that, you know, in that space. And um, but I don't actually have any specific questions at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of tracking along and appreciating appreciating that, you know. Um, and the I like the way though that you're bringing the 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 human side as well as the um, you know the ecological side in terms of and obviously biodiversity um, when it comes to cultivating foods is a is a huge issues we have a yeah the idea of doing more of a permaculture um how to encourage permaculture food systems basically you know so it seems like this if there's any way to subsidize them um or support them in that way that's pretty pretty powerful so yeah i'll just i just really want to track along though and i, I might have like a more poignant question in a bit thanks um, amanda thank you All the, the food that's being produced for the co-op is being permaculture based? Um, it's a mixture. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of different farming practices. Okay. But right. all, um, only one of the farmers are able to fully, fully exploit the conventional uh, retailers. Mm -hmm. so, um, but the other seven farmers are unable to get traction with either the local retailers or export retailers. They're, so the conventional retailers aren't working for them and they lose it. They just can't find a marketplace. Mm -hmm. There's no farmer's market in Jersey either. Mm -hmm. so, so, so for me, as a Dutch, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult. <laughs> I'm, living, I'm living next to the greenhouses area here, producing worldwide. And then we yeah. have, uh, for example, the green heart, where there are smaller farmers, you know, making smaller vegetable gardens. And some, they don't go to the food market, they, they deliver direct. So yeah. some of the surrounding cities or, or villages, the people, they just go to the farmer and buy their food. And it's not being bargained, you know, with the market, market in between. Mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering how much rewilding of the land uh, you envision because a permaculture land is quite something different than you know farmers producing small varieties of vegetables is both in your in your envisioning or or well, is it about the, organic food eating or, or i'm just curious well it, each farmer is um has their own practice mm -hmm. there's one of the one of the suppliers they, they are growing a a rainforest mm -hmm. so and the, um, we get acker root, yakon, um, the, a whole range of herbs. The ra uh, it's called a Brazilian coriander. Fantastic. Have, um, there's, there's a huge variety. He's growing. There's a guy who's um, making. Uh, he's, he's making an orchestra and a food product out of Japanese knotweed, so Japanese knotweed orchestra. 
um, and but also food as well. Um, all the way through to more conventional but organic processes. Um, he's this the guy who's growing a rainforest is quite extreme. There's another there's another farmer who's um, focused on self uh, self self reliance. Yes. Um, but he has a hundred different varieties coming through. Um, wow. He just can't get a much, but he's fantastic for our market because this he brings two baskets every week and we sell out and it's a good discussion piece and it teaches people about what's coming in the next season. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a community cultures bridge, so we've got a lot of different uh, living cultures happening. It's like a nursery, you end up having to look after it every day, you see it all the time. Um, but we'll have, we've got sort of 20 different uh, cultures, from scobies to ginger to all these different things. Um, the, it's very nice. It's, the, farmers are ha the farmers will go, they are broadening what they sow and broadening how they are growing all the time. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a thing called broncage here because mm -hmm. the roads are so small um, they, we have to cut our own hedges and the farmers now are starting to plant edibles in them so instead of it just kind of being some, a field you have to uh, 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 something you have to get rid of every year because to, mm -hmm. Um, they're now sort of looking them edible, looking at them, turning them into an edible places, and then the, the national trust uh, are sort of seeing them as wildlife tunnels, uh, wildlife pathways around Jersey. Mm -hmm. It's a very small amount of land, but they are they are only going to they're only going to plant and grow for as long as the market is there. Mm -hmm. so, really. Well, yeah, it's 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 so they've got to they've got to find markets for their produce, and he there's only there's very there's almost no one buying the rainforest food, but now with the with we've we've launched a product called product called Broncage Green Salsa Verde and Broncage Pesto, which is a green sauce. And originally, a green sauce on the internet, a salsa verde on the internet, has three ingredients in it. But ours, is have it, ours has whatever is growing that's green that has flavour. And that, like, there's products and, met and recipes which have narrowed biodiversity dramatically. But I, originally, I don't think that biodiversity lacked in them. I think they were designed originally for handling all the gr wonderful greens that were around. Mm -hmm. And pesto and all of these other mm -hmm. that originally were much more responsive to nature have become very streamlined and very mm -hmm. simplified. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to find a biodiversity green source online. You're mm -hmm. always one or two ingredients. So that's a, that's the kind of the permaculture process will there are kind of growing a number of people who are looking to grow like that. But so, it's the marketplace which has been the restriction. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm just surprised about the biodiversity already, you know, present on New Jersey. I mean, the amount of products you're, you're you know, the amount of edibles you're speaking of, I couldn't imagine here. I mean, there's a lot here, but it's all imported, I think. So what you're growing, of course, the climate plays a role there. That it's possible to do yeah. that. We, we. This is what is it? There's a combination of, in, of a deep-rooted ecological understanding from the farmers, mm -hmm. uh, from some of the farmers, very few, but some. Mm -hmm. But an, a natural abundance. One of the issues with our our commons land is because of processes done by normal farmers, they've needed to use rapeseed to manage the particular problem they're having with potatoes. Um, 
because they've, 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 they've made nematodes vegetarian, basically. Can you imagine mm -hmm. just turning all, all these little worms into vegetarians as we <laughs> process only vegetarian food? Mm. This army that just got this day when all wor all earth all worms and all maggots become vegetarian and we're just left mm. human detritus everywhere. Anyway, that's my oh, point. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that the our now countryside is covered in rapeseed, so their practices are kind of destroying mm -hmm. the, bi the original biodiversity that was there. Mm. Um, they think it's a biological step forward, but when you see it at the end of the season, it feels very much like a biological step backwards within you know, what the original diversity was. Mm. It's, it's very much about showing, it's, we talk a lot about that side of it. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and we've run a project called, uh, over here with Climavore, um, which is engaging the shoreline much more and um, how every seaweed around Jersey is edible and there's, there's hundreds of varieties. Mm -hmm. um, um, lots of education around that, I suppose. But it, it just seems to me the more we consume it in its variety, the more it will reflect the land that we want to see. That makes sense. I would have just one comment. We make we transactionalize everything. Huh? So now we transactionalize everything. So the project you're, you're describing, you know, it's funny. I, I had a kind of an article on the Amazon that it used to be a, maybe a planted forest once, and now yeah. it's you know, our our oxygen haven of the world. So yeah. I wonder, you know, if if we would go beyond transactions only then actually are you creating a biodiversity forest instead of only consuming what you need to eat i feel with such a diversity people could see that they're building a forest instead of only eating yeah the the you can't go alone into this guy's rainforest you have to you have to go with him because it's yeah. against non-edibles yeah and he the, there is an education you can't go foraging although there's a 400 different things different things to eat you can't go by yourself to consume it without understanding um, it oh uh, yeah what do you mean sorry what i mean is to go beyond transaction thinking only i understand a co-op things of economy of changing eating habits so the eating habits involves and implies another biodiversity which is great which is a product and people will buy and, and I think you guys are on the way and it sounds fantastic already. Mm. In my eyes, it's a great biodiversity that, that's being sketched. I, I don't know the amount. Some are 10, 10 kilos and some are many more kilos. So that's, that's kind of a guessing for me, but they're doing more than just eating. Yeah, well, they've become, they, you switch they are still very passive in their daily routine of consumption but they're very proactive in how in the in by in how they form by biodiversity so yeah there's a financial transaction but it's they are doing a lot more than just eating when they when you start to kind of introduce when you start to introduce this way of of kind of humanizing the broad biodiversity that exists. We don't, yeah. we don't have the, I mean, the second I became a chef, everyone around me said they couldn't cook. The mm -hmm. professionalization of chefing is a phenomenal mm -hmm. disaster. The mm -hmm. professionalization of cooking is a phenomenal disaster for people's ability to feed themselves. And it makes you not want, to, it made me very depressed and also mm -hmm. Burden. I can imagine <laughs> this idea that you have to cook for everyone all the time, um, mm -hmm. and and I ref whenever you give recipes, I refuse to say what temperature the oven's got to be at and the ingredients, and people must taste as they go. And um, it's recipes are an inherent restriction on our ability to use our own senses to mm -hmm. understand how to feed ourselves, um, mm -hmm. which is 
sort of a philosophical issue I have around the professionalization of almost anything. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Mm -hmm. But the, the, I'm not sure, the, if you, it's a math, it is, there is a moment where you can engage with people because it's such an intimate act to eat. It's, it goes through you, it doesn't, it's the most, it's got then it's got a sensory opportunity each time and the hijacking that brands have done over the past 50 years to to absolutely restrict our our sensory interaction with the landscape through food is phenomenal and habitually we have lost we've we've you know, we look at a single colour or two colours now and that will get us hungry. There's no, very few people smell their food, touch their food or have any relationship with it other than I fancy a, I fancy something. It's as much as it goes, I think, for the, the majority of people. Um, but going the other way, the growth of those sensory relationships grow really rapidly and form a very strong bond with the environment. Um, there is nothing more, uh, these are, they're complex flavors quite a lot of these products, but they form very basic and very simple relationships with our senses that have designed to help us eat better and all those make all the right choices and you can just it's very easy to make them very palatable so it's, it's, yeah diversity is easy to achieve i think in diets i'm gonna open it put it out to the floor <laughs> okay i put a little question in the chat but it's more i'll speak to it uh more um as well um which you know so less than the specific of of links or stories or that sort of thing which i think would be a great idea to uh, focus on because you know for example writing on this topic of um you know the of the rewilding uh and the habits because i think um it is kind of at the core is sort of the pattern level and mm -hmm. um as far as the economic side of it i know that um a lot of it is about transitioning economies anyway. So I think of that a lot with, um, you know, how to be able to develop these kind of more um, stewardship oriented projects, you know, around the land. Um, so if you have land stewardship, that's not only extraction based, but there are still, um, there are still things to consume coming from the land, obviously. Um, that is the nature of our, like that is how we are, are sustaining. So. Um, I'm just really curious to see a little bit more specifically of, you know, like it'd be great to even just see images of the places or to see, you know, where they are. Um, not necessarily that you would have that prepared right now, not to pressure that, but just that that seems like really use, a really useful way. And then I do immediately think of it as a pattern level thing that we could help put together, you know, the, um, like the, the, the protocols for how to do this or, you know, the strategy, like how do you help, how do you help uh, encourage um, that type of, um, you know, pattern to happen. And I, I see it a lot, like, I think you've already mentioned this too, that the youth, you know, like having young people experience more flavors and having them, like, you know, I, I think it's a big situation where like people don't understand how to appreciate bitter as a flavor. Like there's a whole, there's a lot of people that don't appreciate bitter um, flavors, but we have like the whole complex palette. And there's these different angles that I think of that are exciting around like how to, uh, kind of tend to this, like kind of wake up, <laughs> you know, wake up more of ourselves to this, wake up more to that biodiversity, to realizing that like, wow, we can eat this. This is just growing here, like on its own, you know, and having uh, like a tour oriented or, you know, like having people be able to visit the sites where the food is being grown and connecting those to the co-op. So that, that also that work of um, reconnecting people to where their food's coming from. That feels like an exciting possibility too. I don't know if that's already happening too. Yeah, I'll send through the um, 
kind of how we it, it's incredible on the sides of this island that when we got all the farmers together they don't they didn't understand what each other were growing they had no idea what each other were growing and they are their competition um they have been they have been farming on the same 45 square miles for the past how many years some three or four generations so there's a there's an incredible amount of unknowing and and reluctance and all of that stuff to just across the farming community um but yeah we built stories around each each one of them um and got pictures of what they were growing and and um how they work uh, to start to tell that story um but again the majority of consumers don't care uh, because they don't have time to care because they have a mortgage to pay and like it's a very there i spend a lot of time kind of having two extremely different conversations and when a, the majority are two mothers and the majority are about very simple actions within the shop so the you've just got to rely on the fact that at home they will prefer the food and they will understand it kind of a more of a sensory level so you i don't it's I, I don't i just assume that the majority of people don't have time hmm. because well, they are, hmm. their time is so demanded upon I kind of want to present to you a question though around that like the habit part because you you know at the center of this suggestion is that habits are um, forming a lot of behavior so I just wonder if those habits of not thinking about that or not not feeling that it's important is ingrained more from the cultural impact rather than that they really don't have time or not but just as a question you know so as we frame this you know is it a habit is it true is it essential you know these are kind of inquiry level one back the question back at you guys would be we we get asked every day to offer home delivery but i feel like i don't want that to be the case i don't want to offer that as a service because it's our moment it to me it's a hype it's a convenience that i don't understand and there's a there was an amazing book written in the 70s of called the future of the supermarkets and he made a prediction of how food is going to be served in the 20th century and 21st century and it it was ordered at screens in your living room and dropped off to your house it's bad <laughs> um, <laughs> the home delivery process is an allowance for that to continue to happen so we've got our steering committee happening at the beginning of the next year and we're, we're trying to understand how to tackle a particular group of people who feel at present they don't have the time without succumbing to that convenience that we don't believe is supportive of this form of system mm -hmm. um, because they need to come into the shop and smell all the flavors or they, they this, this but it's not a quick way of consuming so one of the ideas that people phone in their order and they come and collect it or there's something around it but i am really reluctant to mm -hmm. say yes let's get distributing um I think, oh, it's go on. great it's courageous that you just refuse that <laughs> and also i mean i don't know if, if i travel you know it's, there's very different kind of food habits i totally agree when there's no more time people just forget how to cook also it's bad yeah. I mean, home delivery do you know how many you know wrapping paper that that costs you know i, I was at somebody's home somebody ordered just by app i hear yeah. that because it's packed per per meal. Do you know how what, what you're doing? I mean, I was just like, and somebody actually takes over your kitchen by just ordering in an app. <laughs> I said, why are we allowing that? I mean, 
but it reminds me of American lifestyle. I don't know, I was like once in Canada and people forgot their culture of Europe. I was surprised I was on the side, which was the youngest, it was the most Americanized part. Then every, you know, the only food you could find is, a, is fast food and you have to drive like 500 kilometers to find a, a good restaurant. I was willing to drive that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drive just as long as I find it. What if the... people stop cooking, it's bad, you know, if there's no more time for that. I, I think we should demonstrate like the French to have our lunch times measured and to, you know, still be able to cook and to bring the food on the radio and just tell each other about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, I don't know, it's a very... It's it's a philo it's a definitely a philosophical intersection of how to progress, um, but it is a big it's a it's a big dilemma within our decision making, and I think what we might end up doing is looking for two locations. So we've got an island, you know, it's nine by five miles, but people aren't willing to drive. It's psychotic. True. Um, it, it's true. Uh, it's people are very colloquial. Um, really? Uh, yeah. Um, so it's a definitely big challenge. One of the other... Um, it's cultural. Yeah. It's a cultural dilemma, actually. You're fighting for the sensory entrance of mind and for maintaining the art of cooking and, you know, meeting each other and kind of these things. And people are running into Anglo-Sexic, maybe, I'm sorry, Anglo-Sexic, mindset of running 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 <laughs> and then just ignoring all sensory things it's bizarre yes. yeah the, and you did have a beautiful island where you actually could you know breathe i mean it's not even city landscape you're in you're happy to have a natural landscape if i i listen well yeah our our interact we have a very um I think for the majority of us, there's a false sense of of, um, of interaction with the island. Oh. Partly, there's a real, there's a real sort of, there's a real one because you're physically in it. But then yes. there's, there's a very false one because the majority of people consume food from Marks and Spencers. And, no. And, it's a big industrial yeah. act presence right in, in the dairy and the potato industries so there's a lot of that yeah and all of that majority of that's exported and right. it's the the bit over 25 45 square miles the the industry of potato and dairy is 40 it's just under 50 million pounds a year so it's enormous nice. and it quite a lot of the dairy gets exported to china um oh, no. Yeah. Philippines, and, but a very poor version, not remotely artisan, gets sent, mm -hmm. and it and it gets sent on the basis that we are a very clean and healthy island, um, and a very safe place to consume food from. Um, we have had immense. We've got the highest nitrates in Europe. They've just adjusted the nitrate levels um, of acceptability in our water system. We've got an extremely high rate of cancer. Uh, there's an almost unpalatable level of seaweed on the beaches that destroy revenue from tourism out the year because of the nitrate levels that are coming out. Mm -hmm. um, it costs around two million pounds a year just to handle the current nitrate levels. Um, we've got major soil issues, uh, flooding issues, and we are we're very restricted on, we're already desalinating, I think. We can't retain enough water to, um, after the summer we've had, um, and clean it because of the, how poor the contamination is from the farming. So the majority of the island is very, in a very bad way. Um, and hard. the majority of the people consume food that's imported. Um, oh. And then the majority of the of the restaurateurs um, import food and 
they will they'll make a stand against agriculture but not against not within their financial they won't then order organic food so that's it's sometimes more, well okay <laughs> can i still i don't know yeah. um it's interesting well i don't know i'm just trying to you know compare different places where i've been or what's happening there and i feel a consciousness of you know mo the environmental movement and it helps to also eat better um it, poof. I actually would like to forbid this this global supply chains, you know, <laughs> like because it's just so bad. And if you you know you're buying organic food from maybe you know all across the globe, it has been shipped. You know, people go to the organic market and buy honey from Asia or I don't know South America. We have great European products. I mean, we're both based in Europe. At least we could be somewhat more local people don't know sometimes i do agree when it's more expensive it's hard it helps when supermarkets would promote you know simultaneously the industrial food and the biological organic food in the same time it happens in my neighborhood they 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 put it both in the in the sale you know area so you can really choose and sometimes it's more affordable you know when it's when it's a little bit more lower priced and they at least try the organic i don't know something <laughs> so it's, it's kind of helping to do these little promotions and then one i don't of, know yeah one of the things i noticed on menus is if you put something that was recognizable on the menu that you were trying to push something different yeah the recognizable food no matter how boring it was will only will be the majority sold every time yeah it 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 really and whenever you defended yourself to say, well, no, if you took the boring stuff off, then people would only come for this and they would travel for this. The person holding the purse strings would always disagree and keep it on because it was a bigger seller. Mm -hmm. So whenever that was none, that happened at every restaurant I worked in. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of chefs would refuse to set, put, let's say chicken on the menu because that is by far the most popular popular thing on the menu so it's really difficult to it's really difficult to pitch two different things next to each other yeah and expect the one that's not expected to sell to sell even though it's a better product would, would you say there's bad eating culture i just think it's a i can't work out why that I can't work. It's well. It's the same. It, it's encourage. It's encouragement that is required. It's that. It's that encouragement and understanding, or it's a whole new separation of the supply chain. Uh, I mean, can I offer a few comments at some point? Yeah. 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 I, mean, I hear you. I hear you wrestling with these really frustrating, tangible issues of mm -hmm. shifting behavior and. Um, and I certainly empathize and I don't I don't feel like it's my place to to offer you answers. In, in fact, what I see in what you're what you're doing, India, is just a beautiful example of how locally specific the work needs to be, how well you're tuned to, you know, relationships with individual producers and consumers and the dynamics of your your island and at the same time the challenges you're facing we are seeing as global patterns. So there's, there's some, you know, in terms of what you were asking about, Kiala, you know, what are we, as change agents, what are we wrestling around? I think there is this, this really interesting tension between the uniqueness of each local community and its needs and each system within that community or an interlocking set of systems. And then the, the you know, the larger global patterns as well as scales in between local and global. So I'm I'm just I'm very interested in that and and it's not clear to me for example India you know how much would advice from somebody outside your you know the, the very specific realm of the work you're doing really be helpful um, or what would be most useful um, so that's one challenge I I think the other thing so here's a realm where I think maybe advice or you know co-thinking really applies that that you're, you're you're asking this question 
you know, how do we get people to blah, blah, blah? How do you even use the word manipulate, right? You, um, we want to change behaviors. We want to change habits. The, the science on that is really shows, shows it's really hard. If you don't start when people are really young, it may be impossible or just requires a lot of effort. We don't have a lot of time to do this. And I guess for me, my sense is when, when it's framed inside of that logic, I, I don't see a whole lot of hope, you know, that um, <laughs> the whole notion of manipulating and getting people to do things to me comes out of the paradigm of, you know, that created these in industrial systems and these global supply chains and, and the, you know, advertising driven, transactionally driven system, as you were naming, Amanda. So we want a different system. We can't really design from those same principles of selling and manipulation and transactions and, you know, um, the Charles, Charles Eisenstein, um, I think, writes beautifully on this and, and in his newest book um, on, on climate. You know, he, he, he's particular. he's looking at the green, at greenhouse gas emissions as, as sort of the focus in climate change and measuring that. And, you know, this idea that this is the way we, we, we all have to get around, you know, get aligned around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's how we solve climate. And, and his answer is, is, you know, that, no, that won't work. Um, climate is only one symptom of a larger set of crises anyway, and we're liable to make other things worse if we just focus on that in isolation. And in the end, what he says is it, it's only out of love for the planet and, and one another that we could really, you know, that that's the new paradigm. New paradigm is recognizing our deep interconnectedness with everything. So if you take that to the level of the eaters, right, if they, if there's some way that they can understand you know, as you said, the intimacy of, of eating, that, 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 that what they eat and what they choose to buy is directly related to this place that they're in. And if they can't attach, if they're not present enough to love the Isle of Jersey, you know, as their home and recognize themselves as integral to it and dependent on it, you know, it, it, then they're in the global supply chain and then we can't do anything. But if, if there's a shift, it's to that level of, of recognizing, you know, of loving where they are and who they're there with. That, that all these new habits then just emerge as, as I think as a natural flow. That's what Eisenstein is saying, that, that once you start from that premise, it's easy. It's like a magical transformation. It's miraculous what we can do. And you're modeling what's possible. And then you're, I hear you sort of in this state of frustration, like, you know, why, why wouldn't people want to eat this food, right? <laughs> what's in the way of that? It makes no sense. Or, you know, um, and I think once there's that shift, the suggestion is then, then it, it, it does become obvious why they would want to eat it. Now, how, how to support that happening? Um, you know, there's something mysterious in there. I don't, I don't, certainly don't have answers, but that's, those are the sets of pattern. The pattern. The, there's a group called Jersey in Transition, who, from the transition community. Transition towns, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A guy called Nigel Jones runs it, and it's a moneyless um, organization. And they are a supportive group of this system. Um, and has been, he's like, he's one of the wise men of Jersey who help. Um, in theory, he reads a lot, and is a big fan of Eisenstein. Um, and every time I, there's a, do you, I mean, is money wrong? I'm sorry? Is money wrong? Well, it's simple. It's too simple. Not all context is, is being able to be arranged by one-on-one -on -one relations. Mm. It's not always give and receive only between two people. And money works like that. You have offer and demand. That's it. There's no more complexity possible. Mm -hmm. So in, then, my, in my eyes, yeah. it's just too simple as it is now. Mm -hmm. They also have the externalities that, you know, in the economics model where that are, that need to be resolved for, you know, like if we, if if it's circumstantial to if you just kind of separate out the impact on the environment from the finances then you're actually not telling the whole story and so that's kind of the idea of holistic economics or regenerative economics and getting 
that in there. And I think uh, it's been bouncing on the threads, but the meta, meta impact framework is one of the ways to kind of make it more visible too, to say, hey, here's the social impact. In fact, what we're hoping to be able to do is have it be really visible in the, you know, in the shop, it could be visible, you know, you could say like being able to have the things side by side. And this happens here um, out in, in Cascadia in the Pacific North, Northwest where I am with certain places they will show like a level, especially with the fish, like what the um, impact level is or the quality, like, you know, like uh, environmentally and there's mm. different levels so people can choose, but to be able to know like, oh, this, I'm actually, uh, you know, like there's a social value to this product. Um, or there's an ecological value to this product and having it be visible, especially since we're needing to make these uh, transitional uh, times because we still have a lot centered around money and we're not going to change that instantaneously. And with like years of trying to work on it myself, I'm also like, all right, how do we do this? So I just love the idea that um, having the island example too, that you, you, I got inspired just within that sharing around it, knowing that islands are a way, a place where you get to have a smaller version of what we're actually experiencing as a planet it's like it's still true it's just you know so then you could say hey here's the feedback of the the sustainable development goals and here's our issues locally that are real and here's how, where we're making a difference and i think when people are able to feel like they're making a difference rather than hearing the story that it, they don't matter and that they're too small and everything's bigger than them you know those kinds of those kinds of uh, narratives that, that are part of the the habit changing thing is to so say like it actually makes a difference then changing the habit is more worthwhile you know um i'm just writing that i hadn't we have one moneyless farmer that's it as in any he's book. I mean, <laughs> who provides, incidentally, who's committed to this moneyless mm. position? Um, the this is a total side swipe, side swipe, side side step. Um, some lady has bought a machine that converts reclaimed plastic into other molds of plastic um and it's part of plastic free jersey and it's a weird machine and it produces weird things but i wondered if it could produce a coin and that coin is something that can be used and if there's any knowledge about or examples you know in the transition time they have their own pound um, we've already got our own money um, and it, doesn't, it's, it makes a lot of money for lots of rich people um, but if there, if there was something of in, examples where that a coin could be made as part of that transaction or is that the, just the same thing again and we're missing that process and why huh why why Oh, why? We have money, it works, why? Um, to try and use this plastic machine. A new what? Try and use the plastic machine. No, but why do you need a new coin? It was to integrate the use of the, pla trying to get use of the new plastic machine that this lady has bought. Well, one, I, I one money, coin, machine. Yeah. What do you Here's mean? the. I, th I think if I'm hearing you correctly, so there's a there's a machine in the community now that can take uh, plastic and and reconstitute it and make other things. And you were thinking about making a coin. Um, my to share back on that quickly, like just two parts of it. One, um, a lot of the meta currency folks that I know um, actually discourage creating um, physical artifacts to represent value that way. Um, in a lot of cases, which I was sort of bummed out about because I was really excited about making a community coin in my community. I was like, yeah. but um, it isn't it isn't that you should never do it. Um, but the one way to look at it, to really look at it deeply would be to understand, you know, like how uh, how it's being represented or what's working with it. But one way that you could what value it would be is if it represented social or ecological value within the community. So it's like a complementary currency system way that you can do that and if you can get um 
like using open money. I don't know if you've seen open money, but that's one of the evolutions of the let's uh, model. And so if you were able to create, you know, community, uh, community currency there, although in that case, it's a lot of it is digitally represented. Um, yeah. And then you would have digitally represented uh, uh, and making it visible because the main point of any of that is to have more flows of value visible to people. And so as a learning curve for someone to say, oh, this is visibly making me acknowledging value because currently we have debt backed currencies that people see as valuable without really having value associated to it. So if we actually create value backed currencies and people are seeing the flows of value that way, then that's kind of training wheels towards new habits that are centered around, uh, yeah, bigger Thanks. picture. But, yeah. Thanks for the, um, I mean, that would be extremely discouraging actually. Yeah. I would refuse to consume if I have to consume in different currencies, I will not. I see a clear tendency to digitalize everything and that I don't trust either. So I'm not in favor at all. And I don't see actually, except for a value discussion, but I already had that the last few years. Yeah. I don't see any contribution to, to alternative co coins except for crisis scenario, to be honest. I just think it's unnecessarily complicated and not needed. And I say this as an innovator. I'm bored with currencies. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. <laughs> Again, you know, why do we have to you know, uh, take I, yeah. flows? Come on, we can do that, you know, abstractly. We can have a moral system values discussion. Why do we have to go to coins again? I think it's outdated to me. Yeah, I, I, um, we have a, a, a second home with some of our kids in the Southern Berkshires of Massachusetts where the Berkshires alternative currency exists. It's one of the ones that's been around the longest. Um, and I met with the woman who co-founded it and she was showing me beautiful, beautiful bills that they made. It was just a lovely product. And she's encouraging me to, to use it. And as a new resident in the area, I'm thinking, yeah, I ought to do that. And I went to their annual meeting where they were showcasing all the different vendors that accept the currency. And, um, but whenever I've talked to one of those vendors on the side, they've said they don't really want to receive them. Um, they have trouble recycling them themselves in the economy without losing money on them. And then the question is, why do I, why do I need to do it? I'm already going to patronize the local businesses. I don't need a pretty new form of currency to know that's a value, right? So unless my using that currency is actually benefiting them in some way that they would love to have it, you know, then I'm, you know, let alone hurting them because it's, it's less useful to them than dollars. You know, as much as I want to support the local economy in this beautiful initiative, it is, it's like it's 10, 12 years old and it just doesn't feel, I'm with you, Amanda. We're done. We're done. That's, that's a, I'm going to put that idea to bed and look at that plasma machine in another way. Um, it's <laughs> but it's still popular. I, I, I mean, that's I, a funny I feel thing about it's having some really strong popular. opinion. I mean, like for one thing, just to, I'm sorry to keep just going to uh, reflect back for Ben too, because one of the problems with um, the alternative currencies like the ones you described, like those are, those have been problematic and they're not really the answer, but hopefully this isn't the idea of dismissing the idea that we need a new economy <laughs> or to change the economy because that's the, and that's why a lot of these exercises in just trying to do something different or people, I think there is in many cases value, even when someone just says, Hey, this is, you know, and I'm not saying, and I know there've been a lot of failures with those systems too. So I wouldn't put all your uh, energy into it, India, but um, I think would be over, would be a little bit short-sighted to not hold the bigger picture of the conversation, especially if we're talking about scaling. Um, I mean, at least well, in, I, yeah. And I wonder if there isn't a way to take something like Berkshire's, which is still going on and has a lot of energy behind it, and somehow re-energize that system with, with some new additions that, are, are, that aren't boring, Amanda, that, that somehow are taking us into new space. Um, I'm intrigued by Let's too that you mentioned and Michael Linton who's sort of the, the apostle of those lately that I know. I, I, I bump into him from time to time. So I wanna, I, it'd be nice to get him to do a session as part of the dialogue on, on that whole system. Do you know about Let's India? No, I'm gonna write it down. L-E-T-S, what does that stand for? Don't know. 
local exchange. I, I was a local exchange trading system, I think, or, or local. I sometimes forget. I just met with Michael Linton actually uh, two, a couple of days ago, and he was on the call with, with Daniel Christian Wall the other day too. I was paired with him. He was really frustrated. He's quite <laughs> a character. Fun. In there too, I know. Short yeah. reaction on Kiana because I see you put meta currency. I mean, I'm not unknowing on the, all these, you know, large scale things also. But I still feel, how do you say? I have been on, on projects that are trying to, you know, redo economy in a very fundamental way and not only by currency. For example, they, they have an inner, inner currency or an inner economy which is different from the outer economy, which I don't believe in. I feel we should have total integrity in our behavior and we cannot have different realities, you know, next to one another, then it's not, at least I cannot. <laughs> I cannot have a split personality that with an inner economy in the community and an outer economy in the real world. It doesn't work for me. Then, and I feel still with all these blockchain, scepter, holochain, uh, it's interesting the discussion on flows and values, but I feel the final change is, well, maybe beyond Eisenstein even. So... I feel it's not in currencies. It's not transactionalizing. It's it's beyond that. And mm -hmm. as soon as you move beyond that, then exercising uh, okay. with the banks, also hijacking that is no longer enough. I'm sorry mm. for me. As yeah, yeah. No, I think air is please India because it's your it's your call here. <laughs> We're Can I say this one last thing. Um, so the regen movement started to, to take hold here about two years ago, three years ago, um, by a guy, called, a guy who set up a project called Credible Food. And they started compost for, specifically for the potato farmers using compost teas. A lot of us did my, microbial, um, started training microbial counts and using cover crops. And the system that he learned how to do microbial counts on was incredibly poor, unfortunately, and he lost, he's lost traction within the community. But the one thing that has taken hold is cover crops. And you can see the acreage that of change that's happened in the west of the island. Um, just over from my house is where the original field experiment was at. And we've decided, me and this lady have decided to, in 2020, with um, the Arts Trust here, is to try and, is to, is to convince farmers to give us their cover crop period. And we create a, we, we sort of map, use it as a, as a way of turning the land into an art piece. So it added into the 10C cover crop, we'll add a colour. And that, and that will change from field to field. And it'll be a very visual con thing as you fly over, as you come into the island, you can see the island in, in its entirety. In when the potatoes are there, the whole thing is plastic and you think it's snowing, but it's not. And then the hemp comes through and it all smells like a giant uh, marijuana plant. And then this final cover crop will come through and we'll bring in this sort of variety of color. And so there's a language being spoken about these cover crops within within that later part of the season, which you can hopefully see from the sky. That's, and I was wondering if any of you, um, the project's called Got It Covered, and I was wondering if any of you know of anyone who is looking at, at sort of cover crops or looking at that kind of more, when I find going to the regen farming world, they talk a lot about, um, there's lots of video of, with sort of looking at sponsorship and how to monitor that change. We know a lot, I know a lot about the flooding and retention and you can see quickly if it, if it's going to reduce nitrates and runoff, et cetera, et cetera. But does anyone know of anyone that's commercialized that side of farming in a mitigated sort of way, i.e. drawdown or in a nutrient holding way? Um, and is anyone looking at the kind of that financial exchange anywhere? Does that make sense that you know of? Uh, it sounds like a great research topic. I mean, it actually ties back to one of the ones that I was curious about with permaculture and waste streams. Like, is there anybody 
like are there movements of people that are organizing around identifying waste streams or impacts that can be cycled into other value mm -hmm. and so as a permaculturist like that just that strategy just looking at like here is a waste like here is an excess of something what can we do with it you know and then having people organizing together around that type of thing but i haven't heard of it in that specific example and it feels like you know probably a good one to research uh back to that one of our threads in the conversation that ben mentioned as well just some things are scalable and distributed you know things that are being done the same way globally or in yeah. different places it's great to be able to share that info and then there's those local nuances too so um perhaps something coming out of our time like our next steps are to um you know just create some space where those uh, conversational threads keep keep going um yeah. yeah i'm finding it really hard to to find anything of valuing that of valuing that change within a system and within the farming system, I guess through drawdown or through um, monitoring the difference in the soil quality. And I'd, I'm I'm not getting anywhere in finding anyone who's who's doing it other than through blockchain and other and other things like that so um if anyone knows i maybe missed the, the main i was still messaging to my next call but i was missed the main i missed the main the, question. Oh, Can you rephrase it for me okay so the question is as the soil changes uh, and there was a reduction as the soil changes when you start using regenerative practices mm -hmm. so one of them is being a cover crop and you can um and it does and it's those actively draw down carbon or they store an awful lot more water it's much easier to understand it from water storage and nitrate storage than it is carbon storage i think um is there anyone who's currently trading on that change in practice because it costs a farmer three or four hundred pounds more per acre to plant these more sophisticated crops Mm -hmm. um but so it's been a it's 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 the one element of the regenerative movement that's really taken hold in jersey so it, it's clearly a valuable thing that they're doing mm -hmm. other than compost they haven't removed any of the chemicals yet but they've kept the cover, crop, cover crops so to me it's an access point of of ecological trading so mm -hmm. And I wondered, yeah, so as the, I've sent through an example of what I'm, it, what I'm meaning is, is this organization called End Trading. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, goes back to the, they are, there is a currency exchange, but it's, it's the, the simplistic bit is money. The, the complex bit, which they're trading greater on, is the fact that if they get a farmer to plant this seed, they're hitting nutrient targets beyond 40 years beyond their expectation mm -hmm. so there, there, there is a there is so a could be traded because there's wessex water i mean so that that sounds like um it would be normally part of a policy on on the landscape by gov even to promote a better soil and then to have a circular economy going on there and you know have the right re recycling reuse circular well, actually there this particular this this reduces um pollution this particular farming practice reduces pollution which oh, yeah. West water were originally having to um extract yeah so now that's re being retained at, at at the farm actually, yeah. actually you know i do uh, kevin jones who's part of this dialogue is looking at insurance as a way to capture community-wide benefits. Um, so he, the example that he gave was- What's his name? Kevin Jones. You can find him on Slack. But the example that he, he has a little white paper, it's under the, um, maybe it's what we are reading or there's a list of resources. If you go, uh, I'm trying to think where I've made this available. We're compiling a whole resource list. So that'll be one way to, to get to get these things and i can find it for you later but but you, let's say you have something that's going on in a community that's creating adverse health impacts and it's costing the community as a whole money right he's you know 
similar to what's happening with the nitrate runoff and the, and the seaweed accumulating on the Jersey beaches, right? That's, that's actually having a monetary impact on the economy for the island, but nobody owns that, right? And so um, he's looking at how at creating insurance products that could pay the farmers to to do you know to, to employ the cover crop practices you're describing basically to to create that community wide benefit. Great. I'll have a listen to him. I want to say hi to Tahera who just joined us too. I've been wanting to connect you two up. Um, I was hoping you would make it for this the session, but we're just at the tail end and, and popped on. Sorry, yes. Uh, and thank you for acknowledging that I joined. I am yeah. super late. Um, and uh, I, you know, there, there's something that I'll post as well that I think, because I wasn't part of the full conversation, I don't want to get into it. But there is a, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of um, in transition certification that Kashi, for example, has got in the United States, which is the three years that it takes to transition over to organic farmers lose money and all of this stuff and it's it's entirely to support that kind of transition movement so that's something that popped into my head when you guys were last discussing well discussing this last topic great you know my sense is this inquiry of whether all these uh ways to share resources and share examples and successes and failures and all the things in between, you know, just so that more of the, um, the kind of movement of movement process can happen. And I, I feel that sense, India, of excitement for what could be possible if more coordination happened on the island there amongst different people who have um, value alignment, maybe just on different a breadth of different values, you know, but there's enough of that overlap or the places where they connect and it might be powerful to try and organize an event of some kind to bring bring people together or to bring um, you know in a similar way to what we're doing with these these dialogues here and then you know at the at the local level or just or just um, you know finding the others as we sometimes say. I've invited um, the the self reliance farmer um, to join because he's fun um, and he used to be a coder. Um, and spends he's 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 an interesting guy um if that not it, he couldn't make it today but going forward um the way that's we're done that's half past seven <laughs> um i hope ah i oh, know i am on i don't okay i hope it's been okay and not too it's so weird that everyone's mute. I'm so not used to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, it might be really bad ethics, but it, I get so confused. Um, Amanda have to jump to. I see she's not here. She's here. Yeah, um, man, Amanda signed off. Well, if you um, wanted to share any next steps, I thought that might be nice, or if you want to or not, but just that kind of, I don't know if people have a couple minutes to go over or not, or if you do India, but it just seemed possibly to wrap to next steps. Otherwise I trust also, it's, you know, whichever. Uh, I, although I've said a lot, um, there were some really key points that I'm gonna write in here that kind of altered my thinking which is very helpful, a lot around uh, the economy and um, kind of further impacting uh, the importance of the, I mean, um, the romance of change. I'm going to call it the romance of what you were talking about, about Eisenstein, I'll, the kind of, I've missed my words there. Um, it would be great to to the next steps to maybe I can put forward the crossroads I man it we're at in terms of progression and decision making if it's going to be home delivery if it's going to be these things and what they mean on on the kind of system change idea um, it would be it and what and if it's just a kind of a, a rehash of the same system which is something that I'm very conscious about trying not to do. Uh, 
that would be really interesting. Um, and maybe we, I can book another session in open sessions um, uh, with them with kind of more specific questions. I went broad. Uh, yeah, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, we're thinking even of continuing the open space um, in what's now round three from December 27th to January 7th because it's it's been a little slower getting going than originally planned. And people are still just figuring out how to navigate, you know, what's going on and see the list of sessions like the Harry was saying that she didn't have this on her calendar. Um, so that just getting our systems in place so people that want to participate can be clear on what's happening and when um, you know, hasn't quite happened. Maybe we need a little more time to keep this going. Mm. Curious what other what, what, what all of you think on that. Well, one thing happened. I uh, tried. I've been wanting to be one of those connectoring people, so I did like you know tag Tahara and or India and and uh, Christina in a post from Tahara, and then I was just trying to help coordinate around possibly like a, another open space session that is about food systems, and then it kind of could encapsulate a few different viewpoints. You know, kind of go one extra level more meta, and then and then see what sort of if breakouts form within it or other projects are able to be, you know, um, voiced within that space. So that, and, and the, the, the complexity for me has been to figure out um, where to name it or when and how to schedule together, whether a doodle makes sense or, um, and then the naming of the sessions. And um, I do have the calendar visible now myself and I'm trying to track different pieces, but yeah, that's my experience so far. I'm just trying to tune in and, and, listen as much as present ideas, but also I do want to possibly uh, host that session or co-host it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea, Ben, because you, you, you've seen my, my uh, growing pains and trying to just <laughs> use Slack as a platform. <laughs> um, so I definitely have um, thoughts and ideas and I think really just also seeing how these uh, you know where the synergies are at and, and kind of seeing where the patterns are forming um, so and, and therefore what makes most sense for everybody um, and and so um, hopefully <laughs> I'll get I'll get better at it but yeah pr practice makes practice right so um, I'd, I'd definitely be up for having the open space be carried on for a while and and using that time to have more sessions cool yes. more sessions would be great we did we had 19 sessions last year and i think it was over a similar sort of a three week period but as a host i did a lot more kind of managing of, of getting those 19 onto the calendar i say of of the 19 maybe 10 or 12 were things that I was sort of pulling panels together and themes and you know really being in the middle of it all and, and, and this year I wanted to be much more true to an open space you know framework where the participants are driving that um, and it's still you know that makes it more complicated so I, I'm very sympathetic to your challenge that you were describing Kayla of you know seeing some different possibilities but not being sure whether you should just initiate the session and name it and schedule or should be finding three other people who are interested and having a conversation on the side maybe you do a doodle poll with them and you find you know i mean it, all of these are possible right we're just sort of figuring out what's the best way to have this kind of extended dialogue space that that is participant driven so i encourage you to you know to play in whatever way feels good to you and and, and we'll just learn but if, and, and however i can support that i'm, I'm happy to Incidentally, it's a gazillion times better than being on the internet, from my experience. Just Does that make sense? Text, you know, in text form, like. Or no, just if like going out and I've been doing a lot of research, and you have things fed back. You know, it's it's quite difficult to unpick everything. So these conversations are so valuable from. Uh, for in lots of different ways actually and one of their values is already taking shape in the form of of the of how scoop is looking to um i mentioned this the other day how the cooperative is looking to export 
the idea of Jersey, one of the um, the commercial parts of farming is you export out, people let food from Jersey, people learn about you and they come to Jersey or they invest in Jersey in some way. Um, but that has incredible ecological impact. Um, so actively kind of developing these relationships and these is looking at that side of it. So when I speak to policymakers here, they can they can see something else that's being exported and imported, which isn't ecologically demanding. Um, that's that is a key value driver for Scoop. Not that I'm using you guys, but it's already it was a positive part of the conversation I've had with um, people involved in Scoop um, before having to then send off different produce around. Does that make sense? I'm assuming it makes sense. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, that's very, that's incredibly helpful. Um, you can, I can send you the dialogue between um, myself and the policymaker of the Royal Economy Strategy and to see how that is, that's playing out, um, if you like, over time. Um, Scoop, Scoop is the name of the co-op? Yeah, well, in short, yeah, it's Sustainable Cooperative, but Scoop. Can you drop, I don't know if it makes sense to put it, the chat might be saved and posted into the document, but it feels useful to have those links, um, you know, for folks when they're wanting to just understand a little more. Um, okay. I know our web refer presences aren't always representing the most current, and it feels uh, that way sometimes, but um, to other folks that are haven't seen it yet, it's <laughs> they won't know that part, so we'll still just get the gist. Um, I'm just going to send. I can't spell. Sorry, I, send it to... I, I can put the Zoom chat in, which will probably be part of the notes. I just put into the chat to a, a link to this little form that um, I'm encouraging people throughout the dialogue. Anytime you've got any kind of engagement, but especially when uh, when we do a call like this, to take a few minutes to. Um, to go to that form and just submit some little jewels is the, the metaphor we're using of, of, of you know anything that emerged on the, in this conversation that that struck you or had value for you or challenged you or um, you know a quotable quote or um, any kind of reflection and then at the end of the, the conversational process we'll have a whole set of these we had a I don't know a couple hundred or more of them last year that we were able to use in in the meaning making phase of the dialogue. So. Thank you. All right. Well. And I'm sorry, you know, I almost, you know, sent, tried to text you there at the beginning of the call thinking, oh, God, I wish you, as, as somebody who's doing what really wants to do permaculture based whole systems, you know, whole design, redesign for, for food systems, you know, here's India working at the scale of, of this, of the Isle of Jersey. Who also, you know, spend a lot of time in India studying food systems and working with them there. So, sort of like, you know, I've been wanting to see the two of you, almost like just put the two of you in the middle of a fishbowl and listen to what happens when you share your thinking and your experiences. So, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you yeah. didn't get a chance. But, uh, next time, soon, I hope. Yes, soon, and I will take a large part of the responsibility of that on my end because it's I've, I've just. Got to figure this shit out. <laughs> well, I I'm definitely want to organise another um, open space to, but I'll probably do it in the few, in the next one you're planning, um, to to give myself time to be get better at it. Does that make sense? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> this was but, fun. This was um, very you know this was. At least yeah. from my perspective, there's no, we're all right. getting better at it. That's it. Yeah. The, sure. are you running, holding a strategy circle? Tara? No, uh, I'm not. So it'll likely look like whatever. No, I, I won't be. So mm -hmm. I'll be very interested in how we can weave together what you're working on and, and some of the things that I'd propose in the strategy circle together. 
And this is a good moment to clarify, there are no food system or food oriented strategy circles. Is that right, Ben? Um, well, the New England Regional Organizing Circle is going to have food as one of the lenses that we look at and, and one of the participating um, one of the participants is, is the Communications Director for Food Solutions New England, which is a region-wide systems change initiative. But it's not, it's not just food. Um, is that that was like a, local, a, regional, a regional group. Yeah, so we're looking at, at the regional lens, at, you know, the region, what interventions at the regional uh, level are, are generative for community scale transformation um, across, you know, across systems. Uh, Is that Lisa? Lisa, um, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. okay. <laughs> I'll, I, def, I, I think I'll participate. You know how I feel about the whole New England food systems and all of that, so. I'll uh, I'll participate that and you are you are leading that strategy circle correct? I am and right now we have four um, people that have committed to be circle members. Um, you know, so I'm open to adding more people to that, and I have a list right now of you know, more than enough people. But I'm very sensitive to who's showing up and who has energy and what their perspectives are. So if you want to be a member of the circle, Tara, uh, mm -hmm. I would I would welcome that. Yeah. I would. And, and Lisa is somebody who I'm actually scheduled to connect with because it's happened through something else as well. So absolutely, please. Great. Right. That's <laughs> I mean, great. You're thinking in regional terms, so whether you're specifically already doing work in New England or not isn't really the question. It's more, you know, or, you know is, this, is this inquiry something that will be valuable and that you can support? And I have no, no doubt of the yep. um, I'm glad that came. Go ahead, India. You were saying. But it suits someone from Jersey. <laughs> uh, to listen in. Yeah. Well, we're going to be so. So the circles initiate. You know, one of their functions is to initiate a conversation for the dialogue as a whole that anybody in the dialogue can participate in. So um, you don't. You can play without being a member of the circle per se. And I do want people. I think that have some some connection to New England in in the circle, India. But um I was born in England. Old England, I guess, is I was born in England. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. This is going to go wrong very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, <hasn't. laughs> Everything is connected is the answer to that one. <laughs> but good point. Your point though, Kiala, you know, you don't have to have a circle to initiate a conversation, right? Obviously. Right, right. Did it. So um, the circles were just one means of trying to create little nodes of coherence. Mm -hmm. So to that point, you don't, so you don't need to have a circle. So if we did want to have conversations around food systems, we could still go ahead and have that regardless of whether we have a strategy circle around yeah, it. Yeah. Go, go, I mean, um, go to key info on Slack and you'll see the link for submitting a, a topic as part of the open space. Um, cool. Anybody can do that, just like India did. We got the first one on our agenda. Right. Hey. Yeah, so that was great. Far from apologizing, India, I want to thank you for being bold enough and and you know putting yourself out there, even though you know, especially given that you're not totally comfortable with you know many dimensions of this. So it was really um, great to get started in this way with with the open space. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much to. It. It's been very nice to get to know you guys. Um, and Dahara, it would be great to talk to you because there's, I am, I don't know if there's the right word as calling it uh, permaculture supply chains, but I've given them a lot of thought and worked on one in India that is in Hyderabad that's grow, growing, continuing to grow. Um, and it's very specifically a, a supply chain which is a reflection of a of a permaculture system um, yeah. that's yeah it would be good to talk to you and to get your kind of feedback and if you and the, if there's some understanding there it would be great to under, see yeah I'd love to I'm mindful that you are uh, in Jersey I'm assuming yeah okay 
So given your time difference, I don't know if you want to hang around, if the Zoom's being used for something else, but um, I'm available right now or whatever else we decide. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can, I've got half an hour. That's totally grand. Sweet. Bye guys. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, so two, two things before I go around that is just, um, you know, I'm gonna see if the, we do a weekly ecosystem uh, mapping call with Christina because, Food system mapping, uh, you know, and the map, the, the, that's part of the work that we're seeking to do. And we do have a number of different regional uh, folks that are joining that conversation already anyway. So we might try to stack that and have that meeting be a place we invite some of the other folks to come to in lieu of having another time. And then also, um, I think the food systems and mapping conversation, whether it's a formal circle or it's an informal circle, um, then in terms of not creating too many Slack channels, but whether it makes sense to have a, is, is the creation of Slack channels formal to the approval of strategy or is it okay to, yeah. Okay. No, All right, so then we might, channels, yeah. you, know, you can encourage a conversation in any way you want so we could have a channel too. They just want some naming conventions so that it's, so that the, the channels are grouped together. So it should probably be, uh, um, it should look like the other ones for the movement strategy dialogue. It's M, you know, M O V T underscore strat underscore, and then the name if it's not a circle one. Um, okay. Well, I might do that. I might seek to create that as a place sure. to keep the conversation going too. Beautiful. Yeah, and then you know, Google Docs are another way to experiment with with creating some asynchronous spaces. The Facebook group, you know, is another one. So you know, a, a conversation when you initiate a topic, the way I see it, a Zoom call is sort of the default. Have a Zoom call, and and you know, but there's all kind. There's a whole spectrum of options, including multiple Zoom calls and Zoom calls plus these other things, or just doing it in these other ways as well. It's all it's all you know welcome and and part of the experiment. So I will sign off too, because I'm due to talk to Christina in 10 minutes and I need a break. <laughs> okay, tell her that hi. You can give her an update on this and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I will do that. You can stay on the line though, that's fine. It's here. Um, Thank so, you very much. And um, yeah, and if we can, um, again, just a plug for using that little personal harvest form to, to start generating some little nuggets of jewels from these conversations would be awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, populate that afterwards. Excellent. My own kind of disseminating. Just a quick question around how do I access if I want to just hear this recording? Um, is that Ben or is it India who would be able to? Uh, I'll have a YouTube channel where these all go up. Um, okay. And that'll be shared on the news and key link stock and in key links in Slack, uh, key info in Slack. Um, and probably, you know, since I put a little post on Facebook about this, I could probably share the video there too if you. If you're down with that India, but but you know it's your session, so tell me what you want. I mean, we don't have to publish this at all if you don't want, or you could decide who gets it. And who I don't doesn't. mind. I don't mind. Whatever you need or want to do. Okay. Great. All right. So if you post it on F, uh, Facebook, Ben, if you can just let me know, and then that way I can access it quicker than when you get the YouTube formal channel going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right.